Welcome everyone to episode one of The Way, a Rudis Wrestling Podcast uh, with your host, Kerry Colat and myself, Matt Dernland. How's it going, Kerry? I'm good, man. How are you? Good, good. So uh, as we've been brainstorming the past couple of weeks about uh, this new venture and uh, with, with the, the new role you're, you're, you're serving with the company, you know, we, we were talking about giving something to the wrestling community um, in podcast form that's not currently out there. You know, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of platforms where they're just talking about, you know, different results and different outcomes, the, the latest recruiting commitment, this and that, you know. But, you know, the thing that I think both you and I both find appealing is that, you know, the search for excellence is is ongoing, right? No matter what level of success you achieve, you're all, always trying to chase something bigger and greater. And I think that's where, you know, the genesis of the podcast name uh, came into existence, which is The Way, you know. And so as we've been talking and we've been discussing things, you know, we, 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 we've we been talking about what what is The Way. I think it's The Way is something that everybody's searching for, Right. Whether right. it's every, and, everything in every sport and in all, all shapes and forms and in, in, in every aspect of life, pretty much. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. From athletic achievement to professional accomplishments to, to personal growth, you name it. Right. People are people are searching for for a path to get on, you know, to elevate whatever whatever their mission in life is at that at, at that given given time. And I know you and I, me as a former coach, you as a current coach, you know, you you're always ser- searching a better way to lead your athletes, right? And find finding ways to to connect the dots and to flip the light switch on, you know, because a lot of the things that these our athletes are are chasing it, it seems unattainable, right? Because they've they've never they've never tasted it before, so it's kind of an unknown. Even though, you know, even though they're around you, you know, you're you know an Olympian, you know, world medalist, multiple time NCAA champ, they look to you and it's like man, how did coach do that? And uh, right. so I think, I think the, the role of the coach is always trying to figure out a way to, you know, connect those dots, to flip the light switch on, to, to activate, you know, their potential at, at the highest level. And, you know, I, so in discussing this, you know, and how we've discovered this path that we're on and the, the you know, the, the way that we're chasing things in life, you know, it's, it's all through, learning, right? We're, we're always continuing, continuing to learn. And the, the best way to, to do that is to look outside our current environments and, and dig into areas that, you know, that can spawn new, new growth, new ideas, uh, new ways of explaining things. And so I think the goal of the podcast is what we're going to be doing is, is looking at um, different forms of literature in the next weeks, months, and, you know, ongoing from here to uh, generate discussion, generate new ways of thinking about things. And, you know, so I guess I'll turn it over to you, Carrie, and to, if you'd like to introduce the the first book we're going to be looking at and discussing and kind of like a little bit of the outline of the book and some of the things we'd like to pull out of there. Yeah. So I, I don't think we'll get through the book in, in, in one podcast for those who, who listen and find the time to listen and, and enjoy it and keep coming back, Matt. So, um, but the first book is, is Switch. Um, it's by Dan and Chip East. Hi, uh, Heath. I mean, um, two psychologists, pretty smart guys put this book together. Um, the book sounds, if you try to introduce it to someone um, and you say, hey, it's a book, a, a series of case studies, it sounds like it could be something that's just really mundane and boring, but it's it's actually really interesting. And, and, um, you know, I don't, things that get me excited or, or things I can relate to a lot of times as well. And, and, and reading this book, going through it, I realized there's a lot of things that I did in, in my wrestling career that I could relate to that I, you know, I didn't realize I was doing. And when they did these studies, you realize that it's human nature in some aspects. And, um, the first part of the book, you know, this is really going to help anybody who's a coach out there or anybody leading any kind of team, right? This, this book was written for CEOs and, and managers and, and coaches. Um, you know, it, it's more of the macro side of it, but if you could get your team to read it and realize how, how we think, you know, and how we approach things and they get a better understanding of how, how a human being actually, uh, gets itself going in, in one direction and how to stay in that direction or stay on a path. Um, it's really helpful, but it's obviously going to be more for the coaches. And, and again, the book is, 
it's just ironically called switch and we got the switch in wrestling, but there's really no relation in terms of athletics, but, um, in terms of what the, how the book breaks down, the first part of the book is, is understanding the, 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 the psyche, uh, of an athlete or in, any person that you're, you're managing. And, uh, I like how he starts out in the book. They talk about, they say, everybody's a schizophrenic. Um, everybody has two personalities and they go down and they, they break it down into, you have a, a rider, which is your analytical side, you know, the, the, the side that can, um, get hung up on, you know, going through every, you know, plan from A, B, C, D to, you know, every backup plan. And, and the rider is the analytical side that can sometimes slow you down. Um, and then they go with the, um, the, the emotional side, which is the other personality, which they call the elephant in the book, which is your emotions. Um, or you could say your gut, it's, it's that party that makes the decision and you go for it. And, you know, they lose, they use various, you know, ways to explain the, the elephant in the book. And as one that for, for wrestlers and coaches out there, the easiest way to think about it, anytime you had to cut weight and you're on a diet plan or you're, you're, uh, you're monitoring what you eat and you wake up that one morning and you, you just say, you know, screw it. I'm going to eat whatever I want today. You know, that's the emotion. That's the side that walks out in the kitchen and smells something good and says, I want it. And the rider is that that side inside you, that part of you and inside trying to control that big elephant or control your emotions. And you're trying to steer away from, you know, eating what you shouldn't eat that day. And, and so for us in the wrestling community, it's probably the easiest way to explain it, but obviously that can relate to anything in, in life, whether you're, you know, you know, you're trying to save money and, and get your retirement up, or, you know, you can either take that, that, you know, four vacations or just one vacation, you know, whatever it may be, but, um, that's the breakdown. And, and as a coach, if you can, you know, understand that everybody has, all your athletes have two ways of thinking. They have the analytical side and the emotional side. The idea behind the book is put a plan in place that appeals to the person's emotion, their elephant, and a, and a plan in place that appeals to the analytical side, something that the, the analytical side of their mind can get their head around. And if you can get those two moving in the same direction, um, you know, then you can achieve great things with the team or with a uh, you know, a, a, a team of athletes or, you know, in the business world, a, a team of people under you in, a, in the sales force. Yeah. And I think, you know, when, when you're breaking it down, both the emotional and the ra rational side of your brains, they're, they're both very powerful and both very necessary. Right. So very powerful. And it, yeah. it's, you know, most guys tend to rely on one or the other, right? Some guys are very, very mo emotional when they wrestle and they, they have success that way. Um, but only to a certain point, right? It's, it's same way with the rational guy who thinks he's very clinical in his approach his, and is very directional in what he does. But if you re rely on one or the other, you know, eventually you're going to hit a glass ceiling. So to your point, it's how do you marry these two powerful forces? How do you marry up emotion and, and rational thought? you know, to find parallel paths that can really open things up. And I guess, you know, that's, that's always the in, interesting thing in, in coaching and, and leading an organization is how do you balance those things? How do you connect those dots? How do you, how do you get people to buy into those things? And, you know, it's, it's a very challenging thing, but once you experience that breakthrough, I mean, it's one of the most rewarding things you can actually experience in life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the biggest thing that I, I've learned from over the years with coaching and then going back and seeing when I've had my best moments, whether it's with the individual or whether it's a group of guys or an entire team of guys, is when I was very organized and gave clear direction, you know, and they come back to that to a lot, a lot in the book about you've got to have direction and a clear path and, and um, something that the analytical side of somebody can get around or the writer can get around. And then, you know, kind of what's the carrot at the end, end of the end of the road here, you know, for the emotional side. Um, but you have to have direction, like when you're leading, you know, you know it's like getting up and, and walking into a practice room and, you know, it, not planning out the, the practice the day before, you know, I, I'm pretty good. I mean, I've been doing this a long time and I can walk in and, you know, I might not have written it down the night before, but I can, as on the drive in, I can get my thoughts organized and, and get in there and get it rocking and rolling and, and get the guys moving and, and motivate them for the most part. But everybody has a bad practice, right? As an athlete or as a coach, and there's been there's been a couple of days where I've gone in and I figure I can get it together on the ride in, and and um, you don't, you know, sometimes you're just not, 
you're just not in that, um, you know, that groove and it's, you can just feel that the room's not running as smooth as it should. And it's, and it's because you didn't get those, that path laid out and have clear direction. I mean, one thing that we have right now, Matt, in our room is I, we put up a whiteboard. And so I write out every practice be beforehand and the guys can come in and, and see it. And I probably started doing this two months ago. Um, and, and typically what I would do is let them know before practice, we're going to wrestle here. We're going to work here. We're going to condition at this part. And this is what we're doing. And it allows a guy's mind to get wrapped around in something. But it actually, all you're doing is if you're, you're giving them that, that starting point and that finish line, which is clear direction. But now this whiteboard is amazing, right? Everybody stops by the whiteboard to see the plan for the day. And what they're doing is they're really mentally prepping themselves. And with, without realizing it, what they're really doing, in essence, is saying, okay, it's going to be hard. It's going to be practice. That's probably the emotional side. That's the, that's the fear side, right? How, how tough is this going to be? I mean, I don't think in human nature, I don't think, did you really like killing yourself when you went in the room when you, when you were an athlete? I mean, a, a part of you does, right? But a, but a part, part right. of just yeah. human, human nature is resistant to pain, right? We, we, we try exactly to run right. from it. So, yeah, yeah. you know, once you condition yourself to it, I think it's one of those things. It's a conditional thing. Once you condition your mind and your body to uh, yeah. be, be aware and ab absorb certain things, you know, there's, um, you're aware tested, right? And so you, yeah. you, you get a, a bit comfortable with it. And so it's, it becomes part of who you are, but by in our nature, in and of itself, we're resistant to that. we we flee from pain and we try and, you know, find the path of least resistance. Right. And there's, uh, there's no problem. I think we walk around thinking we got to be these tough guys all the time, but honestly, I, I hated practice. I, I, you know, I tell people that all the time. I like, but I, and I would literally take a, a good 15 to 20 minutes to get psyched up because I knew what I was going to do to myself. You know, like right. I knew how hard it was going to be, um, you know, and, and, and you're right. It's just human nature. And like I said, the back to this whiteboard, I can see what my guys are doing. I can see the, the, the rider side of them, this, this analytical side saying, okay, here's the finish. Here's the starting point. Here's the finish line, you know, and you could see internally they're talking to himself and, th and this, I'm gonna, uh, this is how I'm going to get through it. But when I forget to put that workout out one time, if I just didn't write it on the whiteboard, I probably have now like five, 10 guys asking me, what's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? Cause they've come, they've become so accustomed to it, you know? And so when I don't put it there, it's, it's amazing because what's going on is there's this, uh, you know, back to two personalities in everybody's mind, they, they, there's this fear, there's this, and then there's this fear of the unknown of what's coming. And you can see it can rattle some people sometimes. And, and I realized that whiteboard is clear direction and it really does allow practice to run pretty smooth. Now we don't, do it all the time right they don't they, they they need to be accustomed when when the clear direction is not up there that's part of wrestling it's controlled chaos is it's adversity that you know to be able to wrestle to that too but but i can see the psychological side of what it does by not posting that plan before the training session yeah and i i think you know what the whiteboard does also it it, it gives ownership to the athlete right um yeah they're seeing it they're processing processing it and breaking it down in their own way, in the, in the way their mind operates. And so I, I think that's probably beneficial on a number of levels. Obviously you're going to go over the plan again, but they're aware of the plan and therefore they have a little bit more ownership in it. Right. Yeah. Um, one thing that I always used to, to tell my athletes was don't do what I say, own, own what you do. Right. Yeah. Um, because as athletes, you know, you as a coach, them as an athlete, they kind of have to do what you say, right? I mean, that's right. that's kind of kind of how things work. Um, but to really get the growth and and uh, get the buy-in that you want, there's got to be a level of ownership, and it's just not understanding, you know, understanding what you're doing, not just doing what what you're told to do. And I think referencing back to the book and the path, you know, that that whiteboard is creating a path for your, for your athletes to follow. Right. And it creates a path for them to make sense on. It makes sense to them. They can process it. They know what they're getting into. And I think that's, that's a good thing, especially in this day and age with, you know, it's the information age. Every information is so attainable that your athletes are accustomed to knowing everything. So they're, they're questioning things more. So I think 
withholding that, I think back when we, we were going through a system and going through training, you just, you didn't know what to expect coming in, right? You probably right. knew it was going to be hard, knew it was going to, going to test you in a, in a variety of ways. But I think actually including people in on the process and telling them what you're doing and why you're doing it and the rationale behind it um, really helps you know, since synthesize those things in athletes' minds, prepare the, prepare their minds a little bit better. And, you know, I think in turn that you probably see much better output, right? Absolutely. You get, you, what, like I said, we, we did a show one time, uh, the question was in terms of training and I said, it's easy to, to show somebody it was goal setting. Actually, I was talking about goal setting and, and when you actually lay out, here's point A and here's point B and people can see the finish line. The output is definitely different when 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 it's an unknown. When you don't tell them how long they're going to go, whether practice is going to be an hour to two hours, uh, you know when when the live's coming, when when the conditioning is coming, going back to live. Unknowns throw people off, and um, you know that's the big thing. But it's you know that's part of our sport. We all know that. You know, you want people to be able to deal when there is an unknown, be the leader, be the confident one, and step up and get through it, and you know break it up or chunk it up in their mind. Um, but to really be, you know, efficient as the, a leader in your program or a head coach or a team captain, you know, having clear direction and, and, and clearly explaining that and giving people a plan, you're going to get a much higher output from them. And, um, you know, again, this is, uh, you know, Matt and Kara, we're talking about the book switch. Um, you know, Matt, one of the, one of the parts in the book, did you, uh, did you like the part about the college kids and the cookies? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> that was good. So, you know, for anybody listening, there's there's a quick breakdown. Again, we're talking about the rider side of a person's mind and the elephant side. And and they did a group, uh, they did a study, they called it a taste test. And, and what they did was they invited a group of college kids in and a group of high school kids. And the taste test was, they told the college kids, all, all you can eat, all these radishes and, and vegetables as much as you want. Um, and then they also had a, a plate full of cookies and they said, just don't eat any of the cookies. And then the high school kids were allowed to eat anything they wanted, cookies, vegetables. Obviously, the, the high school kids ate the, uh, the cookies the majority of the time. And they, and they probably sat them in this room for a few hours. And the idea, they thought they were going to get a call later uh, about you know a, a memory and, and taste test. And, and um, But then what they did was they, they pulled a fast one on them and basically they brought in, they said, we want to see who's smarter, college kids or high school kids. And they brought in those puzzles when you did as a kid where you put the pencil and you trace the lines, but you can't cross over another line and you can't pick your pencil off the paper. And the puzzles were impossible. And what they found was when they challenged the college kids and the high school kids, the college kids obviously stepped up thinking they're high, smarter than high school kids. And, and they gave up uh, at, at a, after about 19 attempts. And the high school kids you know, gave up after about 31 attempts. Now, the, the puzzles were impossible to do was part of the study. Um, but this is back to the rider and the elephant where your elephant the whole time, not realizing it, but the entire time you're in there, when you smell fresh baked cookies, like you just want to eat them, right? You just want to get in there and eat them. You don't realize you're using all your willpower and you're draining, you know, that, that, that mental side of yourself, um, to stand up to it, but you don't realize it, that you are wearing yourself down mentally. And uh, I thought that was pretty fascinating. And, you know, I've got, when I look back after reading this book in my career, uh, like I'm guilty as being a bad coach in, in a couple instances um, where I looked at a kid when in my younger days, just coming out of my competition, sitting there saying, well, you know, this kid's weak minded. He's a quitter. He gave up, you know, and that's just, you know, that's young man stuff, right? We all go through it. As you get older, you get wiser and you start to realize people, you know, you understand, you know, kids better. And, and, um, but really what it was is it was, it was just willpower. You know, I, I had a clear direction and a clear path. And so my willpower was greater in a practice session. Um, and it was probably because I wanted to be the best in the world. Right. So I, I had to have a higher standard of willpower and, and I practiced it and, and I kept my, my rider and my elephant in check all the time and kept them on the same direction where this guy, you know, emotionally he couldn't control himself after a while and he would fizzle out during a training session. But I thought that to be a fascinating case study when, when you read that one. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think one of the things that the, 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 the book pointed out is a lot of times we have a limited pool of, of self-discipline, right? Eventually. And, and that was the case of the radishes, right? They had to 
they had to exhaust all their willpower to continue to eat these radishes and push away the cookies. But then when they came to the more challenging task, they were all, you know, their self-control and their discipline was already depleted. And so therefore they didn't, they didn't have the effort or the willpower to give and sustain like the high school kids. It, even though it was an impossible task, the high school kids kept trying over and over and over where the college kids, they, they had already diminished, um, you know, or depleted their reservoirs there. And so they gave up more easily. And I think you see that a lot, a, a lot of times, you know, um, with, with athletes and, you know, trying to get them to the point where, you know, they can balance those things or prioritize those things. It's a, it's a little bit more challenging. And I think that, that, that comes due time and growth and maturity as a coach to recognize those things, because it's easy just to attribute certain things just because they're not getting results. It's, it's easy to want to label your athlete, right? But that's right. to say he's not tough or he doesn't want it, or he, you know, he, you know, he's not disciplined. And you remember Charlie Brennan's? Oh yeah. You remember Char yeah, yeah Char so Charlie, I had this discussion with Charlie. I, I had lost contact with Charlie for years. And the next time I see Charlie, he was there. remember that that uh that show uh Joe's uh Joe's versus Pros. You remember that show? Yes. Yep. Where they took professional athletes against what well, you know, Charlie made the show. I don't know if you know that. I remember turning on the TV one time and saw him there. The next time I see Charlie Brennan, he's on TV again and he's fighting in the UFC. And I remember looking back, I mean, I was like, this guy, like he had a breaking point, you know, and him and I discussed it and he, you know, we, he has a podcast and I was on him. We were talking about, it. I said, Charlie, that was me in my younger days. And, and when I look back, I say, I, I wasn't a developed coach yet. I looked at you as a guy who shut down and quit. And now look at you now, all these years later, you may not have achieved it at the time when you were a division one wrestler, right? You didn't, you didn't get all the accolades that you wanted, but now later in life, it's starting to come because he's starting to figure it out. And he even says like, I just, he goes, I would always get tired or I would fizzle or I just, you know, and, and it came back to like willpower. He just couldn't sustain it. Couldn't sustain the activity for as long as I could, but I was in where I wanted to be. Like I knew wrestling was the only place I wanted to be in at the time. And, um, I think he was still figuring it out now. I mean, you look at it now, the guy, you know, he has had the opportunity to fight in the UFC. He's got a great podcast going, but, um, I look back and, and Charlie is one. I always say he's, he was a guy that, you know, he needed to eat those cookies at the time to keep going, you know, and, and he was fizzling out his willpower in practice sessions or in matches. And now he's doing great, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think that, that, you know, rolls into, to the final point of the, the, the book, the outline is they were they were kind of outlining the book in chapter one and you know, what a lot of kids are looking for is, is clarity. Right. Um, yeah. And what, what the book points out, what a lot of times appears on the surface to be resistance is in actuality, it's just a lack of clarity that things haven't been talked to, haven't been explained. And, you know, the one thing that I always tried to, you know, as, as I grew and matured, you know, I, 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 face similar hurdles that, 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 that you faced as a young coach. But as I matured, as I grew in my understanding of, of young athletes and how they're wired, um, a lot of the times I had to remind myself like, Hey Matt, these guys want to win. Right. So right. you've got, you, you, you've got the biggest obstacle out of the way. I mean, they're wrestling in division one for a reason, right? They made the choice to come to Campbell for a reason because they wanted to wrestle for you and they wanted to win for your program. So a lot of times, sometimes you want to, you know, when, when you're younger or developing as a coach, sometimes you, it's easy to come into like, to create like an adversarial relationship with your athletes when in actuality, it's just a lack of understanding, maybe on the coach's side, side, but on the athlete's side, it's just, they don't have a level of clarity. They haven't been explained or talked through certain things and, you know, they want to do it and they're not, they're not raging against the machine. They're not resisting your coaching or your philosophy or what your culture wants to be. It's just, they need it. They need it explained to them a little bit more. They, they need yeah. to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Right. That's exactly, yeah, it's exactly. And a lot of people need that. Like I didn't need that. Like I, I didn't really need what you're talking about. I, I didn't need somebody to sit down and explain it to me because I already knew it. Like I, was fortunate, right? I mean, I, I was pretty good. So I, I did some some big things in the sport. So my mind was pretty clear most of the time, but the other guys needed that stuff. 
And, you know, so that's why I always say like my early coaching career, I wasn't used to sitting down and talking a kid through it because I just thought everybody got it like I did. And, and you're exactly right. And the one thing you said that stands out, if anybody's listening is think about it, who doesn't want to win, right? Like they want to, and, and the, it, it's building them up and giving them a direction. So they, they, they know how to get there because a lot of guys don't know. They just, they, 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 they really do need direction in, in um, not saying hand holding, but you know, they need it laid out. Some guys need it written out on a piece of paper for them. Other guys, you can just sit down and talk to them within five or 10 minutes and, you know, give them a plan and they can, you know, that plan's good for a week or two. Um, you know, other guys might need a little bit more than that. And that's the important thing. And that's probably the big gist of, of the book as you go through the entire thing. But, but I think, yeah, I, um, I, I, go ahead. Yeah. I think, um, just, just a thought that I had, I think that's a lot of times why high level athletes, take a little bit more time to develop as coaches because high level athletes that have had high level of success. They take a lot of things for granted just because, you know, I think maybe with you, a lot of things came more innately than other athletes. And, you know, what was innate for you is something that's, um, that's way out of the realm of recognition or, you know, grasping it of a different athlete. And so I think, you know, a lot of times when high level athletes transition into coaching roles, that's probably their, their biggest hurdle is to understand that not everyone is wired like them, you know? And so trying to figure out how each, each athlete is wired, how each athlete is individually motivated. And even though you have to have, you have to have an overall plan, mission, and philosophy for your program, you also have to, you know, be cognizant of the fact that you have to uh, individualize it, individualize the message to each individual athlete to, to truly unlock, unlock their full potential. And that, that, that takes a lot of work. You know, it takes the same, the same amount of work that it takes to become an elite level athlete. I think the same amount of effort and discipline takes into, to becoming an, an elite level coach. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's true. We've seen a, a lot of guys who are great athletes and, and not succeed at the highest level in terms of coaching. And that's probably is one of the biggest hindrances. You know, they just, it's hard for them to relate and they can't figure out why somebody can't get it. And, um, once you realize everybody's not like you, then you can start to relate. And, um, but yeah, you, you, I think you're spot on in that. How about, um, the, the bright spot of the book that was uh chapter two, they started getting the bright spots. What'd you think of that part? I thought it, I thought it was good. Um, yeah, I think that would probably be a good segue into the next episode. You know, we've kind of covered the outline of the book, you know, um, one it's, you know, this is the essence of the book is how to change things when change is hard. Right. And that's not only just in wrestling, in athletics, that's all of life. People change is hard. People, people recognize that they need to change, but it, but it's hard to do it. So, you know, breaking down those, those, the three things that you need to be aware of and change is, you know, one, you know, we, we've covered to change someone's behavior. You've got to change someone's situation. You've got to change their path. Right. Um, yeah. The second thing is what oftentimes looks like laziness is, is often exhaustion or they've been depleted to the point where they don't have any more to give. And so they, they give in, they give in as opposed to fighting back just because they're, they're exhausted. So recognizing the distinction between laziness and exhaustion. And then the last thing is what, you know, a lot of times appears to be resistance on the surface actually is just a lack of clarity that you have to really, uh, you know, explain and dive in to each individual person to, you know, um, get them to recognize a level of understanding through their lens. And yeah. so I, I think the rest of the book, you know, if you want to segue into or just give an overview of the, of the bright spot or what we're probably looking into in episode two, finding the bright spot. Um, I think that that would be a good way to, to wrap up the show today. Yeah. I, I, that, that part of the book for anybody listening, it, it basically takes these very complex problems that, that, 
you know, happen in, in, in all walks of life, whether it's running a, a business or rebuilding a business, or, um, there's a part in the, in the book where a, a guy goes over to Vietnam because the, the malnutrition, the nutrition rate is so low that, you know, kids are dying at a young age. And he, he basically hits the ground after he gets off the plane and, and realizes they have, um, uh, sewage problems. They have, uh, clean water uh, problems. They have severe poverty, poverty throughout the entire country. Um, and, and nutrition is poor. And what he looks at is, you know, this could be billions and billions of dollars to fix this problem. And he winds up fixing it, um, you know, for not even close that cost uh, using a, a term he, they call the bright spots in the book. And and basically went out and said, OK, find me the poorest people and, and the ones with the healthiest kids and, and let's duplicate what they're doing. And I laugh at that because I think in our where we're at in society right now, everybody wants to overanalyze, you know, Timmy's problem or that problem. And in the end, look around and say, who's doing it? How are they doing it? And let me copy it. And I look back at my career, I always say like, beg, borrow, and steal. You know, people ask, where'd you get all this technique? I'm like, I watched guys. I stole it from other people. I, I you know, I picked people's pockets on the wrestling mat, like in terms of I, I, I could use that or I could use this. And I that part makes me laugh because I think, you know, if I were put in that position, you know, years ago and I'd have got off the plane, I would have been sitting there saying, this is billions of dollars and it can't be fixed for decades. You know, and, and uh, it's amazing when you find the solution to the problem, how simple it was and, and how he relates it to other areas and how they relate it to other areas in, in life. But uh, that part really was was really good for me. Yeah. So I look I look forward to getting into that. You know, I you know, this is a fun first episode. You know, I I think it's it's probably as fun for me as hopefully it is the listeners, because, you know, talking through these things, you know, you're continue, continuing to learn, continuing to to explore new things. And I think that's, you know, one of the, the great things in life is always, you know, learning better ways, bigger and better ways of doing things. And um, so, yeah, I look forward to uh, next week getting together, um, looking into talking about the bright spots. Good. Well, anybody out there listening, the the book, if you want to follow along, the book is Switch. It's by Dan and Chip Heath. Matt and I get no money for this book. So if you want to buy and follow along, be my guest. Um, you know, but uh, again, the name of the show is The Way. Uh, we're just going to cover different topics in, in, in terms of books we read. And, and um, you know, if we can help along the way, we're going to do it and, and just kind of bounce some ideas off each other and the listeners. So, all right, Matt, I'll talk to you next week. Okay, Kerry. Take care.